Hello everybody and welcome to the first installment of this installment of the Shucks preview videos. That's right, this is not a shut up and sit down review. Rather, this is part of the All Shucks, the Virtual Shucks, the Away Shucks convention in 2020 because in this dang year where publishers can't demo their own games, thanks to a global pandemic, we have offered to demo them for them. So it's very important before we proceed, I'm gonna be walking you through a whole bunch of crunchy Euros that are coming out this year or next year, um, but I haven't played any of them. So all of my opinions are really just impressions based on reading the rules and should not be taken as gospel. Rather, this is just me demoing a game on behalf of a publisher so you can get excited about a hot new release. And what a hot little release we've got for you in this video. This is The Red Cathedral, published by Devere and created by the enigmatically named designers Shea S and Isra C. And first off, you can see you got a lot in this box in which players will be racing to construct The Red Cathedral, but also look how small the box is. Look how compact it is. Look how nice it is. And as we all know, small boxes mean small prices. So already, this game is off to a pretty good start. We have set up a three player game here. You've got a personal player board for green, blue, and yellow. We've got the central board. And also during setup, we drew a blueprint card that told us the shape of cathedral that we were going to build. This is a pretty straightforward Euro game, but nonetheless managed to impress me quite a bit. And not just because it's gorgeous, but because it's got all kinds of unusual elements. Very simply, Players are trying to get victory points by building sections of this cathedral, which starts the game totally unbuilt, and you will hopefully finish the game with it mostly built. Um, on your turn, though, you're just going to do one of three things. You are either going to claim a section of the cathedral to build. You're saying, I'll build that bit. Option two, you can spend your turn when it gets around to you transporting resources from your board to the cathedral in order to actually build the bits of it you said you would. Option three, you can spend your turn going to the sort of central market, this big central board, to get those resources. And this is kind of the heart of the game. I'm gonna teach it last. So if you wanna to choose to spend your turn claiming a bit of the cathedral is yours, that's easy. You're gonna get one of these lovely flapping banner tokens of your color and put it initially on a ground floor card of your choice. So let's imagine I go, I like this bit. You're gonna take the little workshop tile on that and you're gonna have to put it in one of the six slots on your board. Incidentally, the game finishes when someone has built six segments of the cathedral. You can put it face down, at which point it costs you nothing and does nothing, or you can spend some rubles to socket it face up, and then you're gonna get a little bonus when you use dice of that color, but we'll get to that mechanic later. Um, it's as simple as that. You claim a bit of the cathedral, you take the token, done. Once someone has claimed a bottom floor of the cathedral, then let's imagine Blue's next and wants to claim a section of the cathedral. Blue can claim any of these bottom spaces, but of course now I have put my banner here. That represents building the scaffolding, which means Blue can go above me and claim this card here. And that's relevant for a few reasons, but I'll get to those later. There's some really funky stuff to do with how this game finally scores uh, that I'm looking forward to teaching. So, we blue and green here have claimed a section. Let's imagine yellow has claimed a section as well. So we've just taken the you know, first few turns. Now let's talk about how to transport materials to the building site. Materials in the Red Cathedral don't go to the side of your player board. And this is one of my favorite things in the rule book. Um, you actually have an extremely tight inventory. And the inventory is this sort of ruler on your player board, which means as you place your first initial flag saying, I'll build this and this, you're increasing your inventory. So you'd think, it would be sensible to place all those first. It's not a good idea. Um, it's possible for the SAR to get really annoyed with you if you claim a lot of sections of the cathedral but don't actually build them for a while, but we'll get to that. So, I've got my claimed section of the cathedral. This is later in the game. I've got some resources. If I choose to spend my turn not claiming a section but instead transporting resources to the cathedral, couldn't be simpler. You're just gonna pick a maximum of three resources which can be delivered to any cards and you're gonna go bam, 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 that's your turn, done. But let's imagine I did that next turn, bam, and was able to put the fourth resource that's gonna finish this card. All the resources are there. We're gonna flip it immediately. All those resources are gonna go back to the bank, and then I'm gonna take this card, I'm gonna earn the rubles and the points printed on the card, and then I'm gonna flip it face down, and look, we're slowly building out this nice pretty tableau. I'm gonna leave my banner on it though, so people know I built that, it was me. But then a cool thing happens. Let's imagine here that Blue uh, built this section of the cathedral. Now you'll notice in this example that Green has not finished this card at the bottom. 
That's embarrassing for Green. In fact, the rulebook uses the specific words, Green will then be chastised by the Tsar, which I love. Um, but simply put, what that means is that as players above you uh, finish sections of the cathedral, if you haven't finished your sections below, you get increasingly penalised and your score tracker moves backwards, which is lovely. So, you want to build sections of the cathedral, and that's fine just so long as you don't have players claim sections above you and build them first. Really like that mechanic. Once sections are flipped, though, then you have the option of adding ornamentation. Everyone starts the game on their player board with one door, which goes on ground floors, two windows, which goes on middle floors, and one crucifix, which can go on the top of the cathedral. And by paying resources and gems, you can additionally add ornamentation to anyone's card, and that's gonna give you some points, quite a lot of points actually, but also it's gonna really change how the game scores because, da da da, each column of the cathedral is a little area control game, okay? So, uh, and the taller it is, the more cards and ornamentations are in it, the more points it's worth. But only the player who put the most effort into each column is gonna get most of those points. So there's a whole area control game going on in addition to this resource management game. It's very cool. Um, we'll push for time though, so I'm just finally going to describe the third thing you can do on your turn, which is get those resources that you're going to be desperately needing, and this is, feels like the heart of the game. If you choose to do this action, you're just going to pick one of these five dice, and first move it forward as many spaces as shown on the pips on the dice. So, let's say I chose to move this blue two. I will go one, two, and it ends up next to this yellow dice in the brick section. I'm going to get two bricks, shown by the circle, but because there are two pips on the dice I moved, I'm going to get that twice. So I'm going to get four bricks. Does that sound good? It is. But here's the problem. You can take a maximum of four bricks, but you don't have to, because remember, you have that incredibly tight inventory. You don't want to clog it all up with bricks because resources can only be removed from this once you deliver them to the cathedral. So it's a game of, oh, I'm here now, yeah I want as many of these resources as possible, but how can I, actually, can I actually shift them? Getting resources from this is only one of several things that will happen and you can trigger these things in any order. You can also, depending on which quadrant of the board you're in, representing spring, summer, autumn or winter, use the randomized tradesperson card that is on that section of the board, which offers abilities. For example, this woman here, if you have your dice end up in this section, she will let you pay rubles to transport some resources to the building site. That's pretty cool. But also, so in addition to getting the resources shown on the dice and getting access to these actions, also, 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 you're gonna get uh, the abilities of workshops that you filled. So remember when you claim these cards, you get those little workshop tiles that you can socket into any of these areas corresponding to different colors of dice. That means that when you move that dice, you will get that bonus printed on the workshop card. Uh, so that is pretty neat. Finally, after you've got all of this, triggered all of these actions, so the workshop plus the dice resource plus the card actions, if you want them, you're gonna grab all the dice in the section of the wheel that you ended up on, you're going to give them a little rolly roll, and then you're going to put them back, changing the board state for the next player around the table. That uh, about sums up the gameplay of uh, the Red Cathedral. The game, as I said, ends when someone has completed all six of the possible cathedral sections they can claim, because you only have six banners, at which point the game goes into scoring, the player who completed their sixth section first gets a few extra victory points, and then you're gonna get victory points for, like I say, the area control game you're playing, where every column, let's say, so this big tall one, this is fun, every completed card in it is gonna be two, four, six, eight, and then 10 points, plus another point for every ornamentation. So let's imagine someone threw a crucifix and someone threw on a door and someone threw on a window. That's gonna be a total of 13 points, but only the player who built the most in that column is going to get the full 13 points. Everyone else, the second most is gonna get half as much, third most is gonna get half as much again. Let's check I'm right about that. I was right about that, so that's nice, isn't it? Also, I should mention that this game, like so many games uh, at the minute, has a full-on solitaire mode in the manual, so it plays just one player as well. I think this game looks really neat. I'm always a fan of games that pack big experiences into small boxes, and I was kind of shocked, honestly, when I unpacked this dinky little box and then looked at setup, and it was like set up for a full-on Euro game, you know? Um, and yet it's not too difficult to teach. Uh, this, for me, just hits that sweet spot. It's good looking, the rules seem interesting, the mechanics seem appealing. 
I am quite excited after Rorschach's to give the Red Cathedral a little play, see how good it truly is. But there's just no time to waste. There's at least four more crunchy Euro games that I have to preview. Let's get our skates on. From Capstone Games and Foyerland, this is New York Zoo, a charming tetromino laying game about filling your zoo with creatures great and small. It plays with 1 to 5, takes 20 to 60 minutes, and has designer Uwe Rosenberg's fingerprints all over it. New York Zoo is, at its core, an efficiency race. Uh, each player is trying to completely fill their grid with these tetromino pieces. And if you fill your grid completely with pieces, then you win instantly. But at the same time, you're also trying to fill up these enclosures with little chunky animals. If you fill an enclosure, you get to place attractions, and attractions will fill your grid even quicker. Actions in this game are super simple. All you do on your turn is pick up this elephant and move it one to four spaces around the edge of the board, stopping on either an enclosure space or an animal acquisition space. If you stop on an enclosure space, then you take an enclosure and pop it onto your grid. Note here that you have to place an animal onto that tile as soon as you place it, either from your houses, your storage on the side, or from an existing enclosure. So here I could place this flamingo, or I could place this kangaroo, but not in the same enclosure. The animals do not get along. You've got to keep them in separate spaces or else. The second kind of spaces are these animal acquisition spaces. If you land on those, then you will acquire those animals. So in this example, I will be taking a Arctic Fox and a Flamingo, and I can add them either straight into my zoo in an enclosure, or keep them in these little storage houses to be brought into the zoo a little later on when I place a new enclosure. And here there's an important rule. If you ever fill an enclosure completely with one kind of animal, so here we have filled up this enclosure entirely with flamingos. You then get to take all of them off that board and put them back in the supply, except for one, you can keep one if you want, and then place an attraction onto your board. So for example, we can take this little three piece and put it in this slot here. So we filled that up and we get a little bit closer to filling the board completely. However, animal acquisition is not the only way that you can acquire animals in this game, as in traditional Uwe Rosenberg fashion, if you ever cross one of these sticky out spaces, that type of animal will breed. So in this example, passing this space means that these two meerkats in this enclosure will produce another little meerkat, which we pop down. You can do that in up to two enclosures of each animal kind, and you will only ever produce one extra animal of that kind. You can't have multiple animals breeding multiple other animals. And just like that, I've explained pretty much all of New York Zoo. It's a straightforward, simple little puzzle, and the first player to fill their entire grid wins the game as soon as they do it. It's wonderfully simple, but there's a lovely crunchy puzzle in the middle of how you're going to balance placing new enclosures and putting animals in them to score the maximum area as quickly as possible. Um, I'd also be remiss not to mention that there's a light and breezy 30 minute game if you so desire. Uh, we played that one on stream and it was a treat. And there is also a robust solo mode if you're into that as well. So that is New York Zoo, a lovely little game from Capstone and Foyland, designed by Uwe Rosenberg. Hello and welcome to this digital edition of Aw Shucks Previews, where we're taking a look at Renature from Wolfgang Kramer and Michael Kiesling, published by Capstone Games. We've not got a physical copy of this one to demo with, so we're going to be using the Tabletopia mod for this demo. So what is Renature? At its core, it's a game of placing dominoes. Each player has a big chunky stack of these and the game only ends when you've played or discarded every last one. You're using the dominoes to make little paths of woodland critters from the top of the board to the bottom and dropping off various kinds of shrubberies along the way. And then those shrubberies are going to give you points when the areas they are planted in are scored. It's a light, tight, little puzzly thing with lots of opportunities to be mean. And it's got quite a homely and relaxing presentation, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's get to the most basic of rules. First off, what do you do on your turn? The first step is selecting a domino from your hand and placing it into a legal position on the board. What's a legal position? Well, if you've played dominoes, then you'll know what you're doing. You have to match both sides of the domino to the things around it, unless the space is empty. 
And additionally, you have to follow these green paths. You can't place a domino into the brown field spaces that border them. There's also a wild suit at any time shown by this tracker up here. Currently it's birds and we'll get to how you change it a little later on. So you've placed your domino and are feeling pretty pleased with yourself, but you may do something else on your turn, and that is to place one of these various shrubberies into a field space adjacent to the domino that you've just placed. You've got multiple varieties of these on your board, and each one has a different size. Turf is one, bush is two, pine is three, and oak is four, and you have fewer of the larger ones. Now, why would I place a shrubbery? Well, placing something onto these little fields will not only score you a tasty point there and then, which you'll track on this gorgeous score track around the outside of the board, but it will also score you an additional point for every other piece of foliage in that location, regardless of who owns it, which is neat. But it's not the neatest or meanest thing that happens in this game, so let's quickly hop onto that real speedy. Clock wipe. I've scooted the game on just a little here and you can see that black has got a little one point shrub and a three point pine in this area and white only has a one point shrub. But you'll also notice there's a sandy wooden colored shrub in here. This is a neutral piece that both players have access to when they're choosing to place. Now, white is just about to place their next domino and if they place it here, it will seal off this whole area. And whenever an area is completely surrounded, it will score based on the player's total shrubbery points in that area. Whoever has the highest total will win this little token that grants them the top points as well as an end game scoring bonus. If you have the second highest, then you'll get the second highest points on the tile. Crucially, if you're the only one in an area, then you score both sets of points and you get the end game bonus. So ideally, you'll want that. However, we've now got the most important rule in all of Renature, which is that if any two colours of pieces are tied for a position, they completely cancel each other out, as if neither of them were in that area. And that includes the neutral pieces that both players have access to. So let's take another look at this example. White will place this domino, which seals off the area, but they've also got the opportunity to place a piece before it's scored. They could place one of their own pieces, which will give them a higher total and they'd claim the big points, or they could use one of these neutral pieces, which will bump up neutral's total to the same point as black's, thereby cancelling them out so that white can swoop in and take the points, which is brutal. And that's pretty much all of Renature's core, but it's wrinkled just a little more by the addition of these cloud tokens. Uh, essentially, you start with a full bank of these and you can collect more by laying dominoes next to certain spaces on the board that house them. Why would you want those? They can be spent at any time during your turn to do some different things. You can spend them to change the wild suit, you can use them to take a whole other turn, or maybe, most excitingly, you can use them to grab one of your pieces back off the board to then place a little later on. They're also worth an extra point at the end of the game, so they're worth holding on to if you've got them spare. And at the end of the game, you'll score any leftover unsealed areas, though you won't get the hidden points for them, just the face value ones. And then you total up your scores on this lovely little border score track. And that's it. That's all of Renature. Uh, some extra details are this game seats up to four players with slightly smaller player boards. Uh, it's published by Capstone Games, designed by Kramer and Kiesling, and it's part of their new Simply Complex series. That's Renature. It is a lovely little thing. Ooh, we have a very big bouncing baby board for you next. This is Catan Legend of the Conquerors, put out by uh, whoever publishes Catan, Catan Studio, I knew, I knew it was something like that, and designed by Klaus Tuber, designer of Settlers of Catan, and Benjamin Tuber, progeny of Daddy Tuber. Now what we have here is, if you can believe it, a little legacy campaign, not for base Catan, but for the Catan played with the Cities and Knights expansion. If you have not heard of Catan, I'm going to give you the briefest whistle-stop explanation. Basically, it is an award-winning German classic in which players sort of compete for space and resources on a map of hexagonal tiles at the start of every turn. My dice! You are going to be rolling two dice. Uh, this is on the start of your turn and everyone else's turn. Look at that, snake eyes. The odds of that are... What, what are the odds of that? One in 36. Uh, and then the hexes that match the numbers will produce resources for anyone with settlements on the outsides of that hex. So in the case of this, that two means this 
wheat hex will give a resource to the white player. That wheat resource will go in white's hands, allowing them to build more roads, more settlements, and scrabble their way towards more points. Um, that's the classic game in a nutshell. The Cities and Knights expansion adds uh, Cities and Knights. I mean, the most sort of striking piece is this wonderful flippy little sheet. You are able to upgrade your science buildings, politics buildings, and trade buildings, unlocking new special resources and new abilities, and increasing your odds of being able to draw from three new decks of development cards. Uh, yellow, green, and blue. Cities and Knights, I might describe it as adding a little bit of what you'd expect from a city building strategy game to Catan. You get little knights who run around the board, you get uh, all kinds of different fantastical abilities on those cards. But the knights are primarily used to keep Catan safe. Let me show you something. <laughs> what we have here is the board in which you will advance this boat periodically uh, throughout the game, and when it reaches this uh, intimidating looking charging barbarian space, you're gonna count up uh, the total value of knights on the board versus the value of everyone's towns. And if there are more towns than knights, the player who put the smallest amount of knights into the battle, or has the smallest amount of knights on the board, gets one of their towns raised. However, if you're able to repel the knights, if you collectively as a group of players have more knights than you do uh, cities, then the person who had the most knights is gonna get victory points. Which finally takes us to the Legacy expansion. So Legend of the Conquerors is a special three scenario campaign box full of stuff that's going to tell a strikingly ambitious story of barbarians attacking the legendary island of Catan. Now, as usual, when Shut Up and Sit Down reviews Legacy games, I don't want to spoil all the twists that arrive in the short little campaign, uh, but I will just reveal two of the big, big features. So the first, is that they, it replaces the deck of blue politics development cards to better suit what's happening in the campaign. And what is happening in the campaign? Well, this is really pretty exciting. So as we've got a new bigger barbarian invasion board here, and as it reaches these spaces with a purple flag, what you're going to do is actually deploy actual barbarians on the board, like so, on these uh, landing spaces. Ba-bam, ba-bam. And then once they are on the board, they are going to move. And uh, the way that happens is that you're gonna be rolling this dice with three swords for each barbarian on the board, and you're going to advance them in that direction according to the little uh, sort of swordy, arrowy, pointy thing. Now there are a few things that are going to be very exciting as these things tramp across the board. And the, <laughs> the prominent one is that when they move into a space, if there aren't enough knights on the intersections around that space to defeat the token, you're gonna take that resource numbery thing and flip it, and it's gone. As in that space will not produce any more resources because it has been conquered. And if you're able to later dispatch these barbarians who are charging around tearing resources out the ground, uh, you can reconquer that territory again. What's also interesting is that the Legend of the Conquerors scenario one at least, uh, see, because I'm not going to tell you what happens in future scenarios, has uh, several possible ending conditions. You see, if this scenario ends as Catan usually does, with one player reaching a set number of victory points, then you're going to, in the style of traditional legacy games, assign victory points, sort of campaign-wide points, to the players who came first, second, third, and fourth. However, if the campaign instead ends in defeat, which is either because these marching hexagons conquer too much territory, or because the game uh, sees the boat getting all the way to the red dice at the end and no one's reached the victory point total yet, then the scenario ends in defeat. And then the players who get the most campaign points, it doesn't matter who got the victory points, you're gonna get campaign points based on how far you advance down what's called this hero track. So if the scenario ends in defeat, you'll get more campaign legend points only if you killed more barbarians than everybody else. But as you can probably guess from the thickness of this booklet, uh, there's a lot more mechanics and items and components and ideas in this campaign that I am revealing in scenario one. I was really quite surprised by this. I didn't know Catan was uh, being quite this experimental. I also learned as I was learning the Legend of the Conquerors uh, sort of legacy expansion, the campaign expansion. Uh, they have done this before. Uh, there's another very popular big expansion for Catan called Seafarers of Catan. 
And just like I've got set up here with Catan, Cities and Knights, and the Cities and Knights campaign, there is, in fact, if you could, another way to do this, you could do Catan and Seafarers of Catan and a Seafarers of Catan expansion. Again, full of new ideas and new ways to play Catan. I have now said the word Catan so many times, it doesn't make sense to me anymore. Let's move on to the next game. Next up, we have quite the beefcake from Czech Games Edition. It, this is Lost Ruins of Arnak, designed by Min and Elwin, which I presume is two people and not one person with a very strange middle name. Uh, what we have here is a big, heavy Euro game of resource management, deck building, track advancement, beating up monsters, all kinds of stuff. And uh, I will just head off some potential criticism at the pass. This, you would think, resembles some of the uh, colonial sort of themes in games that the board game industry has been quite rightly sort of questioning more recently. Lost Ruins of Arnak is entirely based on a fictional civilization, almost a fantasy civilization. Um, as you'll see with some of the close-ups of art in this game, it, it very clearly is not trying to resemble anything resembling a human culture. All the same, this is still a game about... Uh, tromping across someone else's historical territory, digging up arrowheads and uh, publishing research on uh, a long forgotten civilization. If that's not your cup of tea, of course uh, we would respect that. However, uh, we're here to demo this game for you and that's exactly what I'm going to do. So, in this game, I've set up a two-player game here. Every player is going to get two chunky wooden archaeologists. They're going to get a private little deck of cards. They're going to get this little camp board. One of you, the first player, is going to get this charming alarm clock. And then uh, you're all going to start panicking, I would guess, at the size and scale of this board. But it's actually relatively simple, okay? I'm going to point out first how you win, and then how you play, and then a shop, and then we'll basically be there uh, with your grasping of the game. So to win this game, um, you're going to get points from all kinds of stuff, but mostly you're going to get points by sort of learning about this sort of Arnakian, maybe that's what they call it, this Arnakian civilization and publishing research. And that all takes place along this sort of papyrus track along the edge of the board. Every player has a magnifying glass and a journal, which represent you seeing things and then you writing them down. Um, so, as you'd imagine, you can't write down stuff you haven't seen yet, so you're going to be advancing both of your tokens, the magnifying glass and the book, but the book can never advance further than the magnifying glass. Now, as you advance, you have little dividers showing what resources you need to give up to advance. So this first step, you could uh, drop a ruby to go up this side of the track, or you could drop an arrowhead and one of the exploration tokens representing how much you've explored the island to go up this track. And then you're going to get rewarded for all of that hard work because every time you move your magnifying glass, you get the resources shown at the top. Um, and every time you advance your journal, you get sort of permanent buffs, but also points. You're going to get points for both of these things. And if you get all the way to the top of the track, you unlock some incredibly valuable spaces and you can start discovering the lost city of Arnak itself. But we're getting distracted. Basically, this is a track in which you will pay a variety of resources, taking a variety of paths to get to some fat, juicy points. But really, the exciting thing about Arnak is this middle bit, okay? This is the terrain itself you're going to be exploring. And while it looks very sort of detailed and overwhelming, it's actually hugely simple. So all this is are worker placement spaces, okay? So when it's your turn, there's a variety of things you can do. But the simplest thing you can do, and I should suggest one of the things you can do on your turn is pay resources to advance one of your markers up this track, like we discussed. But how do you get resources? I'm so glad you asked, hypothetical person. So one of the th other things you can do on your turn is take your little person and put them on any of these spaces along the bottom. Well, actually, you'll put them in one of the slots at the bottom. And to do that, you need to pay the associated travel costs. So these five spaces at the beginning, let's pick up the hand of cards from your personal deck you're dealt at the start, um, you're going to have to discard one of these travel icons in the top left in order to get your archaeologist to one of these beautifully illustrated spaces, all of which offer different resources. So if I want to, I don't know, sort of go to where these parrots are hoarding rubies, I could discard a card with a boot, and then I would move my archaeologist from my personal player board to there, and then I would have the ability to get a ruby. Now, there is a hierarchy of uh, travel icons in this game. So, uh, fear 
are the bad cards in this game. There's a lot of very spooky stuff going on in Arnak that will force you to take fear cards and put them into your deck. And fear cards are negative victory points, but do at least provide a boot icon, which is the lowest level of travel icon. Basically, if you're really scared, turns out you will walk somewhere. Um, this, this is certainly true to my experience in real life. Um, but boots are the worst kind of travel icon. And if you want to travel to these better worker placement spaces, up near the top of the board, you're really either going to need cars or you're going to need boats, which are higher levels of travel icon. And there's an even higher level, which is planes. If you've got a plane, you can go anywhere, um, just like real life, sort of. So you're going to be discarding travel icons from hand to move your archaeologists onto spaces to gather big chunky resources. And you're going to use those resources to advance up this, uh, this research track, right? Wrong! Because there's another thing you're going to be spending resources for. Actually, there's loads of things. Um, you might spend uh, resources going to the shop instead. And the shop has this fabulous moon staff thing uh, that's gonna, that is both the round marker of the game, so it can show you whether you're on round one, two, three, four, or five, but it also divides the shop in half. Because to the right of the staff, which is at the beginning of the game, most of the slots, you're going to put these item cards, sort of equipment that your explorers might bring with you. And you can, on your turn, instead of moving an archaeologist or spending resources to advance up the track or discover a new location, you can acquire a card. And these cards are so cool. Um, I'm not sure you can tell in the B-roll of this video, but uh, the variety and the sort of, uh, just the care and TLC that's gone into all the art in this game is a true delight. Um, it's not sort of like, I mean, I like the quest for El Dorado, but that was very generic explorer-y fiction. This, as adventure fiction, is top-notch. Uh, it's really, really fun. Um, so yes, you've got all these items you can buy, these cards that will give you special abilities. But on the left of the moon staff, we have artifact cards, which are even more expensive and even better. And so as we move from round one to round two, uh, we're going to have more artifacts and less items, and so on and so on. So that's nice. Um, so, these cards you're getting are, by the way, something else you can do on your turn. If you have a big fancy card, like a cool journal, you can, on your turn, play the journal for its effect. Um, and of course, that journal, once you've played it, doesn't go anywhere, or rather, it doesn't leave the game. It goes on the bottom of your deck, so you're playing a little deck building game here. As you acquire items, you'll play them, they'll go on your deck, you'll draw them again. So that's fun and satisfying, isn't it? Um, but I should uh, really... let's refill the shop because I'm a good boy. It doesn't force other people to do that for me. Um, let me talk finally about my favorite thing in Arnak, which is how you unveil additional worker placement spaces behind these basics. So let's say I discarded cards with um, a sufficient number of boats to send my archeologist over here. First off, I'd grab the idol. That's a nice little uh, benefit that I can get and I can slot it onto my board later if I want, but that's some advanced rules I'm not going to get into in a brief overview. Then you're going to take the top card of, uh, the top tile rather, of this kind of exploration deck. And, <gasps> ooh, look what I've got here. I've got a spooky cave to the, um, to the Arnakian bird god. And that space is going to give you fear, but also stone tablets and rubies. So a bit of a trade-off space there, but certainly way more efficient than the five starter spaces. And look, so I've gone there and I would get those resources and that's all great. But, uh, well, it's partially great because I do get a fear card into my deck. That's bad. But places in Arnak are not just sort of passively waiting there to be explored. No, no, no. They have guardians. Now, see this huge deck of guardian tiles? So, yeah, I have unlocked that worker placement space both for me and for everybody. But it's guarded by, oh, in this case, a huge, horrible stag beetle. Now, uh, what that does, well, first off, anytime anyone unlocks any of the worker placement spaces, it's always going to come with a monster. And the monster isn't necessarily going to stop you doing what you're doing. They're not murderous, but they are horrifying, which is why once you've, you know, let, let's imagine that in a round I send one of my archaeologists there, another one there. Um, at the end of a traditional worker placement game, you would take your workers back, and that's what happens in Arnak. But um, in the case of Arnak, if you take your worker back from somewhere where there is still a monster, you're going to take that uh, person back, but he's going to come running home, he or she, they, whatever, it, they're going to come running home with a fear card, and that's the penalty for you not dispatching that monster. And dispatching a monster is the other thing you can do on your turn. So just to recap, you can send a worker to a space, you can explore, you can advance up this track, you can buy an item, you can use an item, or 
you can go and kill a monster. Now printed on that monster are what you need to discard in order to defeat it. So in the and this is often some quite fun thematic stuff. So in the case of this stag beetle, you have to discard some gold coins, then use an arrowhead, which I would imagine is like, distract it with gold, and then while it's looking somewhere else, get it in its neck. Yeah, I, I said that these monsters weren't murderous, but you definitely are. Um, so, if you uh, choose to spend your turn discarding the resources to kill a monster, first off, that are, any archaeologists on that space are not going to be spooked at the end of a turn when you take them back. Um, also, you get a permanent little bonus that you can discard this monster, well, you can sort of expend, uh, you can use once per game. And also, any monster you slay is worth five victory points as well. So that is a brief overview of Lost Ruins of Arnak, one of the most sort of florid and colourful Euro games that I've seen in quite some time. And I would be really excited to give this game a play. Like, there is no element of this game that uh, isn't sort of aesthetically pleasing, from these chunky, unique tokens, to the big tiles you get to place, to the art on the cards, to the map on the board, and the board is double-sided as well. You've got a slightly different setup if you choose to play with a snake temple instead of the friendly bird temple that we have on this beginner game. So that's Lost Ruins of Arnak. Absolutely beautiful, I'm sure you'd agree, and potentially lots of fun. But as with all of the games in these preview videos, I cannot confirm if it's fun or not because we have not played them. We are only demoing them on behalf of publishers. Let's take a look at the next game. The last of our crunchy Euro previews is going to be the Transcontinental, a game about building the biggest railway that Canada has ever seen. It's brought to us by Wheelhouse Games and designed by Glenn Dresser. It takes about one to two hours to complete for one to four players. It's quite crunchy, so we'll jump straight in to the teach. Players are each taking the role of a contractor looking to have the most influence in building this fine railway. Essentially, each round of the game involves the train travelling from the east coast to the furthest point it can west, and then turning back again to be resupplied and make the journey once more next round. Before the train moves, you get to place down these chunky telegram tokens into this central board. And when the train reaches those telegrams, the player who has that piece gets to take an action in one of the bordering spaces, like producing resources or contributing to developments. And when the train gets to the railhead at the end, you'll collectively bid on how far you want this thing to move, advancing the train into new territory. And the player who bids the most gets first pick of the rewards. Something that's really neat about this game though is that the train itself belongs to all the players. So the resources that you'll be gathering to bid on extensions, add new cars to the train and create developments along the track all sit on the train itself. Here, this counts as one iron for the blue player. As the train travels along the board, a player might decide to take the develop action, which involves lifting their cubes from the train with the goal of eventually filling all the spots on the development so you can flip it and put one of your houses on that spot. Thing is, there's a lovely rub here. A player can pick which resource cube they use from the train, but anyone with resources behind that one can also choose to contribute to the project, hopefully trying to bag themselves a development and some points. It's only the players that bid the most that get to put their little warehouses on these spots, thus giving them access to the actions and points later on. The thing is though, is a player can always use the farthest back resource in a cart, meaning that there's no one behind them and therefore they're the only one that gets to bid. So you're trundling along this track, loading resources into your big shared train and then oh no, the track runs out. This is the railhead and when the train reaches here, players collectively bid resources, with one particular resource being worth double, to push the train tracks forward. When this happens, you add up the total resources of all the resources bid, and the railhead will move forward that many cumulative spaces. And then each player will pick one of these rewards to get for themselves, with the first player getting first dibs. And there's a bunch of neat little rewards here, like being able to go first, or extra endgame scoring bonuses, as well as ally cards and all kinds of other nifty little things. Then the train heads back the other way, and you'll do another session of placing telegrams and gathering bits and bobs before the train returns to be resupplied, where new carts get added onto the train. Sometimes, when gathering resources, you might have a bit of spillover, where resources can't be placed on the train itself. And if this happens, they go into carriages in the yard, 
and when you get back to the supply, the player who fueled the train with the most coal gets to pick which carriage goes onto the train next, and they'll earn points for the resources added in this way. Something important to note here is that the carts you're adding to the train are double-sided, and the little hidden resource here shows what can be carried by that cart if it gets flipped. And that happens as soon as a resource of that kind needs to fill that space. So your best laid plans can get jumbled pretty quickly by a rapid conversion of a cart. There are, of course, way more rules and systems and icons and opportunities in this box, like these investment cards that give you rewards for placing your little houses on certain territories at the end of the game, or these ally cards which give you powerful one-time bonuses to jettison your train to victory. And as the train gets more and more elaborate and long and complicated and the tracks get longer, the options will spill outwards. But I'm gonna keep it kind of simple, because honestly, I was surprised at how easy this game was to teach once you can pass the iconography. I looked at this box and thought, oh my god, and suddenly it all clicked into place. But that's not to say there aren't meaty decisions. I'm really excited to give this one an actual proper run. Honestly, I'm kind of in love with the colours on this thing. It's vibrant as hell in a way that plenty of other quite dry trainee games aren't. This board is a meandering, painterly journey that is gorgeous, and the work-in-progress box art looks absolutely lovely to boot. The iconography is super clear and delightful, and these player boards have all the information you need to play the game right in front of you. It's not just a pretty face, though. These bidding and resource-gathering aspects are enticing. So that is The Transcontinental from Wheelhouse Games, designed by Glenn Dresser, available next year, I think. And that is all for this edition of Orshuk's Previews. Thank you very much for watching. If you are around on the 16th to the 18th of October, which could be now, could be in the future, or could be in the past, then you should check out our excellent online convention. It's jam-packed with excellent guests. You can buy games from publishers directly that will support us and them, and you can buy merch from the Shut Up and Sit Down store for the first time and play all kinds of games with all kinds of people from all around the world, from all kinds of publishers. And if that doesn't sound like your cup of tea, well, don't worry, we've got a whole YouTube channel of other cool content that you can watch as well. And that's it for this episode, episode of All Shucks Previews. Hope you have a wonderful day. Bye.